Psalm 144, if you want to be turning there, Psalm 144. We are headed into the uh, Christmas holidays, and uh, it is a, a, a great time, an intense time, uh, and some of us do not understand all the meaning of Christmas, so we pray that this next few weeks that we go over some of the Psalms, that you will gain appreciation for what Christmas is all about. We've been going over the book of Psalms for quite a while now, and the Psalms have various types of Psalms. And one of the types of Psalms is called the Royal Psalms. And these Psalms have to do with the king. The king in his various uh, experiences, whether he was out in war, or the marriage of the king, the coronation of the king, the various aspects of the king. And so since we're heading to Christmas, and Jesus is King Jesus, though he was born a child, we just sang, yet he is King, then it's only appropriate, I thought, to go through some of these royal psalms. And Psalm 144 is one of those psalms, and it's a prayer of a king as he is going to uh, lead his people, and he prays to the Lord. And so we're going to see this prayer. John 17 that we just read was the prayer of Jesus to the Father. And we're going to see a number of things that are very similar here. But sometimes we are not aware of the need for King Jesus. And why is that? Well, because we are deceived uh, and we have powerful, powerful deceivers. Right, uh, Things, the world, uh, Satan, our own hearts, take us away and, and bring in darkness. And we do not value Christ the way we ought to value him, the value that he has. And so there's the great problem that many of us and the world is not aware, is unaware, unaware of the tactics of the enemies. Uh, the enemies will promise life, but will deliver death. And they do it in such a crafty, slick, uh, convincing, logical way. And we, like uh, bulls led to the slaughter, just go along and then boom, they get us. Uh, life. Well, the world and Satan and our own hearts are moved towards things and wealth and money and possessions and earthly power. And we think that all those things, if we know how to manage them, are going to live, deliver life for us. Ah, fulfillment, joy, satisfaction. And we go after those things. And then when we have enough, we feel like, ah, who needs God? <laughs> we don't say it, of course, but that's the sense. One of the passages that is more uh, astonishing to me, uh, Revelation chapter 3, if we want to be turning there, Revelation chapter 3 is the reality of how we can deceive ourselves and feel great. Listen to this. Feel wonderful and yet be full of cancer on the inside. It's an amazing thing. I mean, and most of us that are a little older know what that means, right? We have drunk alcohol to the point that we feel great and then the next day we want to die or drugs, or whatever it is. We've known the deceptiveness of having illegitimate pleasures only to receive a feeling of bleh afterwards, death. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, Jesus, Jesus is speaking to the church and he knows 
everything, everything, our emotions, our thinking, our decision making, our relationships, our values, he knows everything, right? And look at what he says in uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. This is their experience. They feel great. I have all the money in the world. I have all the air conditioning that I want. I have all the Walmarts around me. I have all my cars that I want. And if I don't have it, the government will give it to me. Or I have plastic. Somehow I'm going to get what I want. And I don't need anything really. They're feeling secure. Everything they want. But that's not the end of the verse, is it? How does the verse end? And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Oops. <laughs> See, God reveals the truth of what's really, really deep inside. The Lord has to sometimes slap us around to wake us up to the realities. Now, some of us are in touch with that pain, in touch with that loneliness or that rage, that wound, deep wound, but we don't know what to do with it. We're very aware, but maybe we've lost hope in that there can be any change, you see. Uh, so we have to be honest and raise questions, right? Well, where really are you? Where are you? Uh, in your relationship with things, have things taken over you? And you care more about things than about people, than about God? Have things taken over you? Uh, how are you with your relationship with people? Do you have a number of people that you deeply, deeply love and they know that you love them and you know that they love you? Are those the types of relationships that you have? Trusting, loving relationships? Or are you more on the defense all the time? Nobody really knows you because you defend yourself and you're not going to give yourself away. And everybody, you stiff arm everybody because you're afraid. Is that where you're at? Where are you in relationship to things, in relationship to people? Where are you in relationship to God? Is there a profound worship of God? Do you wake up in the morning and say, God, how can I serve you? Because you are my king. Or is it more like God? Oh, yes, God. Oh, yeah, I, I ought to pray. Is that the relationship you have with God? Is that the relationship that I have with God? We have to ask those questions so that we can get down to the truth. Now, the Lord knows all this. And the Lord knows that we need a, we need a champion. We need a king. We need someone that can deal with the enemy uh, rightly, effectively, powerfully, and bring life to us. Because we can't do it ourselves. One of the things that God has done from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve, is to seek to humble us. Because it is only in humility that we're able to receive life from him. And from Adam and Eve on to now, he's always working. Because we are hard-headed and we're self-sufficient. We think we're self-sufficient. And we think that we can control life. And it's, a, it's an illusion. We can't control anything that really, really matters in life. And so we need a king who is able to, to enter in and speak truth and powerfully be connected to God and fight for us and do what's necessary. And we all know that's King Jesus. 
That's King Jesus. But uh, God has done something kind of like, I wouldn't have done it that way, but then I'm not God. <laughs> you know, God has decided to use human beings. I mean, he's nuts. He's crazy. But he's decided to use human beings to accomplish his plan of glory and salvation. And that includes you and me, you see. That includes you and me. I, I, it's just mind-boggling. We're going to see in Psalm 144 that even the psalmist is like, okay, God, if you, if you want to do it that way, all right, it's crazy, but... And we're going to see it in Psalm 144. So if you will, turn to Psalm 144. Um, this is a prayer of the king who is turning to the Lord for help in ruling in an environment of evil people. He is confident that the Lord will answer him and the people under his rulership will have peace and prosperity. And thus envied by the world of non-believers. That's what this psalm is about. As I read the psalm, just pick up those uh, themes. This is God's king is full of trust in his prayer. That results in peace and prosperity for his people. That's the message. I think of Psalm 144. God's king is full of trust in his prayer that results in peace and prosperity for his people. I'm going to read the psalm and make a few comments on the translation, and then we'll uh, look at more of the details so we can understand what this king is praying. Right? Uh, first of all, I want to point out that uh, you see the word in the very first, blessed, and then at the very end, verse 15, a blessed, and then again blessed. Those two words are different words for blessed. And just know that as I go through the explanation why that's important. And then also, uh, Lord, L-O-R-D, uh, is the personal name, Yahweh. Um, this is the, when Moses said, Lord, what's your name so I can tell the people I am Yahweh, meaning I am the ever-present one. I am who I am. I, I have been from all eternity. I am now, and through eternity, I am. I am the ever-present one. This is my personal name. And I wanted to point that out because it becomes very important as we seek to understand this uh, psalm. Psalm 144, let me read it. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, uh, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. O oh Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountain that they may smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and confuse them. Stretch forth your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me out of the great waters, out of the hand of aliens whose mouth is speak deceit and whose right hand, it's the right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. And upon a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you who give salvation to kings, who rescues David, his servant, from the evil sword. Rescue me and deliver me out of the hand of aliens whose mouth speaks deceit and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Then uh, the NASB has let our sons, I think it's a better translation, is then 
because it's a result of the uh, new international version, I think, picked it right. So I want to read, Then our sons in their youth will be as grown-up plants, our daughters as corner pillars fashion as for a palace. Also, verse 13, following the result, Then our gardeners or barns uh, be filled, fit, uh, furnishing every kind of produce in our flocks, Bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. Again, following 14, the results. Then our cattle uh, bear without mishap and without loss. Let there be no outcry in the streets. How blessed, or we can say how envied with desire. How blessed are the people who are so situated. How envied, how blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. This is the prayer of the king, our champion, who is uh, praying to God the Father. Here, it's King David. If you see the superscript, a psalm of David. And so this is the earthly King David, but then we transpose, we, we, we see King Jesus in the, old, in the New Testament. And this is a royal psalm that points to Jesus. And so we're going to see some of the same characteristics of Jesus here. So here's how I break down the psalm so that we can kind of get a handle on it. Verses 1 and 2 is the king's confession of trust. The king as a champion has this complete uh, trust in God Almighty. And that's how he enters into leadership and into battle. Complete trust in the Lord. Uh, verses 3 through 11, the king's prayer request. Here's the king's prayer request. Remember John 17 that was read was really King Jesus praying to the Father. And then finally, verses 12 through 15, the king's answered prayer. The king's answered prayer. So we begin. Uh, the first two verses is this complete trust of the king in the Lord. And don't you want someone like that? Wouldn't it be great for someone to lead our great nation with absolute trust and a relationship with God? A relationship with God that is unshakable. And he turns to the Lord and uh, well, that would be wonderful. For any nation in the world, we don't have that now. And we won't have it until the Prince of Peace comes back. But here, this king is talking to God, and he says, Blessed, that is, uh, I'm ascribing to you, God, what you have. I I'm acknowledging who you are. And then he gives a whole list of who God is, who God is for him. Right? How blessed are, is, be the Lord, uh, this ever-present one, this personal name, God is personal. God is not just some force out there. No, he's personal. He, he, he feels the way we feel. He thinks. He makes decisions. He relates. He's a person. You see? And that's what we need to realize. Because sometimes we don't see God as personal. He's just some knowledge or force out there. No, he's very personal. Blessed be the Lord, Yahweh. Uh, and then he begins to list who is God. Uh, my rock. He is my sure, powerful source of all that I need. When you think of a massive rock, you think, oh, man, that's solid, immovable. You can always count on it being there. You are my rock, God. You are my sure, solid source of everything that I need. But you know what? Remember when I said uh, God uh, chooses to use human beings? And, 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 and here we have it. God is almighty, but he chooses to use human beings to carry out his plan. And so now the king says, oh, who's trained my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Yeah. God's using the king. 
And he's trained the king. His hands and his fingers, meaning all my resources, all that I am, body, soul, and spirit, all my faculties, he wants to use them in what he wants to accomplish. I mean, if I was God, I'd send two or three angels, take care of this, take care of this, and boom! <laughs> but I'm not God. <laughs> He's God. He's choosing to use human beings. And so the king says here, God is my rock, he is the Lord, but he has trained me to carry out his plan. Now in that carrying out of his plan, now he continues to describe who God is for him. And we begin in verse 2. My loving kindness. God, you are the source of my love. You are the source of everything that I need. All your kindness, your forgiveness, your tenderness, your grace, your mercy, and your faithfully loving me. You are the source of that. That's the beginning. And my fortress, literally Masada, Masada is one of those places in, in, in Israel. It is a, a massive uh, uh, mountain. And then at the very, it's very sharp going up. I mean, it's very, you can't go up there. And then at the top, it's flat. So if you can get up there, you, look at, look, you, you can look at your enemies and, man, you're pretty secure. Right? Anyway, David says, you're my fortress. You're when I can go and... And be protected. Be secure. You God. You God. You God. You're my loving kindness. You're my fortress. My stronghold. Um, that has more to do I think with a position. You put me in a certain position of prestige. Or, or power. Or whatever. But you're my source of that. It's not my own thing. Even though you train my hands and my fingers to do things that I can do. And God has given us all things, right? A mind, hands, abilities. Uh, but the king is not relying on that. He's saying, God, you're, you're my source of my position. Uh, my strong and my deliverer. You rescue me. You're the one. My shield, you protect me from getting hurt. You're, yeah. Uh, in whom I take refuge. You're the one, when I'm in trouble, I run to. You see? And you keep me secure. And then he keeps going. Who subdues my people under me. Uh, God, you've asked me to rule. I am the king. This is, this, this is a prayer of the king, King David. And you've asked me to do certain things in life. Uh, here in particular, you're, you're, I'm the king. But you, you're the one that convinced people. You're the one that get things done. And... You subdue them under me, under my rulership. We all get uh, tempted to think it is our own power, it is my own doing, and uh, forget that ultimately it's God. Ultimately it's God. And here the, the king is saying, God, you're, you're, you're the one. Now, so you get this expression, a realization, this king is completely dependent on the Lord. He's looking to God for everything, right? And now he's going to pray. Now he's going to, to pray. And as he prays, the first thing is like, man, God, how in the world can you, being the, who you are, you are the sovereign ruler of all that is, should you even think about human beings? We're so insignificant, God. We're so insignificant. Verse 3, oh Lord, what is man that you should take knowledge of him? What is Adam? Adam is uh, connected to earth. I mean, man is earthy. I mean, didn't you say, for dust you are and to dust you shall return? We're dirt. What is Adam? What is man that you should... Take knowledge of him. The word there for knowledge is uh, an 
intimate knowledge. You know how he thinks. You know how he feels. You know his longings. You know his decisions. You know his fears. You know everything about why would you even take that intimate knowledge of dirt? That's what he's saying. Or the son of man, different word, which uh, says uh, it's a uh, frail, weak man. Not only is he earthy, he's weak and he's simple. Uh, that you should think of him. You use mental energy to think about him? I mean, when you would think about it, listen, you know, when you're up in a plane, 30 some thousand feet, and you look down, and you can look at a, a big bus, and the big bus is like real, real small. You can, if you can possibly make out a window, you can't see the human being, they're so small. And you're only 30 some thousand miles, uh, feet away. Can you imagine? Millions of miles away, forget it. <laughs> and God is the God of all the universe. And so here the king is saying, man, God, we're so insignificant. You, why would you even use mental energy? And then if that wasn't enough, he continues in verse 4. <laughs> man, it's like a mere breath. <sighs> Did you see that breath? I didn't. That's man. That's what the psalmist is saying. Now, you've got to remember, uh, the psalms are poetry, right? And in poetry, the poet uses certain uh, words and phrases and pictures to express something, right? They're not necessarily, here's the concrete reality. They're trying to express something. And so here the poet is saying, man is so insignificant compared to, to you, God Almighty. Uh, a passing shadow. Anybody pay attention to passing shadows? I don't. <laughs> well, man is like that. Wow. What does this say about the king? What this says about the king that's very, very important for you and for me is this. That when the king prays to God, there is a profound humility. A profound humility that doesn't demand, doesn't say I have the rights, I have the authority, you should God. Nah. Nah. God says, okay. When we pray that way, God says, all right, we have to go around this mountain again to teach you humility you see so here the, the the king is saying i have utter comp complete trust in god almighty but i must acknowledge man if he doesn't do it forget it complete utter humility now from that humility now he begins to give his prayer uh his petition proper here's what he's actually requesting all right and he says about his enemies. And uh, it's very interesting. We're start, starting verse 5, he begins his prayer. Bow down literally means tear open. Part the heavens, God. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. He's saying, Lord, whatever it takes, leave heaven and come help us. Whatever it takes, God, you're God Almighty, but tear part heaven. Perhaps just like you parted the, right, the Red Sea, part heaven and come down. And then he says, touch the mountains that they may smoke. Again, this is poetry. And mountains are put for powerful, seemingly invincible enemies that have uh, political power, financial power, military power, whatever it is, they're immovable, they're powerful. And so the psalmist is saying, come, touch 
those enemies that are so powerful against us, God, that they may smoke, meaning they melt away because God Almighty has addressed them. They're not immovable. They seem to be immovable. Whether it's Satan, our own hearts deceiving us, or powerful world enemies constantly attacking us. Oh God, leave heaven because we need you to touch our great powerful enemies. Fla flash forth lightning and scatter them. Uh, to scatter them uh, and send your arrows to confuse them. You know, when somebody has a lot of power and they're concentrated and all of a sudden somebody's able to scatter all their power, their effectiveness as a military force or whatever is really reduced, right? Now they're scattered all over the place. And then on top of that, if the enemy is confused, even less effective. And the psalmist uses a... Um, a natural occurrence, a powerful, powerful storm. I don't know if you've ever been in, a, in the middle of a powerful storm, especially when the lightning hits real close to you. Oh my goodness, you jump off the ground. Uh, I've been in a few of those. We were sleeping one time in Arkansas. And uh, <laughs> I decided that we're going to camp. Come hell or high water, we're going to camp. And we were out there in the middle of nowhere. We were in the park. And a storm came. Híjole. <laughs> it was a nor'eastern. And we were in our tent, right? And they started to shake. And then the thunder and lightning get closer and closer. And one time, boom! I'm, I don't know. Nobody saw me because it was night. But I'd be totally embarrassed. I jumped off this high. <laughs> Pow! Wow, man. <laughs> and that's what the psalmist is using here. God, bring your lightning and Pow! And they're like, oh, oh, they're running all over the place. God, you can do that. And that's what the psalmist is saying. God, leave heaven and come shoot your lightning. So they scattered and then their arrows and they confused them. And so that's the first thing. The enemies can be very, very powerful, invincible. But now he continues. In verse 7, stretch forth your hand from on high, your hand stands for the power of God. Stretch your power uh, from on high, meaning from heaven again. And now here's the reason now different enemies, not only, or perhaps the same one, but here's another characteristic of the enemies. One that can be very powerful, overpowering over you, your boss, your, your company, your, 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 whoever you're employed with, or your whoever. They can seem uh, overwhelmingly powerful. Or they can be very, very deceptive, lying. And that's something that occurs all the time, all the time, all the time. No, we are promised certain things, but that's not what's being delivered. So now here the psalmist says, uh, stretch forth your hand from the on high, rescue me and deliver me from the great waters. The great waters, just like the mountains are put for powerful enemies, the great waters are put for the, for, for the peoples of the world, people everywhere. The great waters is put there. And maybe in the sermon discussion we can see how I got that. But it's for the great waters. And in fact, the, the following, the parallel shows that it is people uh, out of the hands of aliens, you see. See, where it says, out of, out of the great waters is the same preposition that is in out of the hands of aliens. And then he further describes these people whose mouths speak deceit. And whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. A lot to say there. Uh, <clears throat> out of the hands of aliens. The aliens here stand and for uh, not those God. that. They do not make God their Lord. They can maybe even acknowledge God, but they don't follow God. You see, those are great aliens, non-believers, so to speak. And even believers that re refuse to follow God. And then he further says, those who speak deceit, it's lies, 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 lies. In fact, when he further describes, whose right hand, right hand stands for their greatest power. Their greatest power. And what is their greatest power? They rely upon lying. Deceitfulness, that's their power. Their right hand is falsehood. You ever be around people that lie all the time? 
say something and they don't mean it? Or they promise something and something else comes out? It's terrible. You're relying upon their promises and boom. Like, oh, no. And we find that everywhere, everywhere. And that's what he's saying. The great water, these people are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Behind every bush, so to speak. I'm using that as an example. But they're everywhere. And so the psalmist is saying, man, Lord, deliver me from this. And when you do, now he gives his vow of praise. His vow of praise. I will sing a new song to you, O oh God. Meaning, I'm going to sing another song because again, you delivered me again. You see, and we will always have something to sing to God about when we turn to him, when we look to him. We will always have something to praise the Lord about. I will sing a new song to you, O God, upon a harp of ten strings. I will sing praises to you. I'm going to use whatever resources I get to praise you, to describe what you've done. And here he kind of describes it, who gives salvation to kings. Who's writing this? King David. And King David has seen, had seen in his life many times, many times when God had delivered him. And he remembers. And let me tell you, you and I need to remember the times that God delivered us. Yeah. I give people the advice. Whenever you've seen God work in your life, write that baby down. Write it down because you're going to forget. And those times that God has delivered us, man, they're gold nuggets. They're gold nuggets. Because when we are discouraged, we can go back to that list and say, oh, yes, I remember that. Oh, God is with me. And that's what the psalmist, is, that's what David is doing here. Who delivers David, um, who gives salvation to kings, who re rescues David, his servant, from evil sword. He remembers how many times. And then he repeats again what he prayed before. Rescue me and deliver me out of the hand of the aliens whose mouth speaks deceit and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That's what they rely upon, falsehood. And we've all been victims of falsehood. If not, we ourselves have used lying and falsehood. So here's the king praying. And now he says, uh, Lord, when you answer my prayer, what's going to be the result? What's going to be the results? And you see, the results, look at what the king is concerned about. The king is not so much concerned about himself. He's concerned for his subjects. He's concerned for his people. Because now look at the results. Then our sons in their youth will be grown up plants. Our young people are going to be as mature they're going to have deep roots and they're going to be healthy and strong and productive. They're going to be fruitful, God. When you answer my prayer that you take care of the enemies, God. Our young people, our young men are going to be strong and productive. And then our women, uh, our daughters, verse, the second part of verse 12, our daughters as corner pillars fashion as for a palace. Uh, the corner of... Uh, Beams need to be strong. Not only are they strong, they're going to be beautiful. As for a palace, our young women are going to be strong and beautiful to glorify you. That's going to be the result, God, when you answer. Then our barns will be full, furnishing every kind of produce. Our agriculture is going to be bumper crops every time. And then our flocks are going to multiply by the thousands. And our cattle bear without mishap and without loss. There isn't going to be an outcry out in the streets. People won't be crying because, oh, they've got needs and they've been abused and then be used. No, none of that is going to be gone. God, when you answer Here's the king, what he's concerned about. He wants peace and prosperity for his people. And that is Jesus Christ for you and for me. You see? And then he ends with saying, you know what? When all this happens, Lord, 
Your people are going to be envied by the world, by the non-believers. That's what he's saying in verse 15. How blessed, how envied, how, how people are going to desire to be in their position. How blessed are the people who are so situated. Means they're under the king, they're under the Lord God Almighty. How blessed, how envied are the people whose God is Yahweh, the Lord Almighty. You see? So here we find the king, God's king. He is full of trust in his prayer when he prays to God the Father, you see. And as a result, there's peace and prosperity for his people. And we see this in Jesus Christ. Who is he concerned about? He's concerned about his people, you and me, his believers, you see. So let's look at a couple of things, how we can apply this. Um, First of all, Jesus, we sang about him leaving heaven and coming to this earth. Coming to this stinky, guilty, dirty earth. What was the king praying in Psalm 144? Lord, part heaven, tear heaven open, come down, help us. And that's what Jesus did. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is the eternal uh, Son of God. The one who's been here from all eternity. John chapter 1 verse 1. John chapter 1 Verse 14 says what? Look at John chapter 1, verse 14 in the New Testament. John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word, which was verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, in fellowship with God from all eternity, and the Word was God. That same Word, that same Logos in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. And dwelt upon us, dwelt among us. Jesus was born, having been God from all eternity, he took on flesh. He broke heaven apart and came down to help us. That's King Jesus. And you and I need to have a good appreciation of Christmas. Noel, the first Noel. The first night. No wonder the angels broke. I've got glad tidings, God, for you and for the whole world. That's who Jesus is. Jesus trusting in the Father. Um, uh, Do you know Jesus as your savior because there is no other king? King David was the one that wrote Psalm 144. King David committed murder and adultery. He failed miserably. We needed a king, absolute righteous, absolutely powerful, who could pay for all of our sins and Jesus had to, he had to be born as a human being. If he had never been born as a human being, he could have never have died. He would have only stayed deity for all eternity and never die. He had to become a human being. And he did. Trusting the Father. That the father knew what he was doing. Just like the king in Psalm 144. Jesus had to trust the father. Yes father. I will go down. I will be born. Utterly. Completely. Vulnerable. As a little baby. And when he came. We humans missed him. 
right? He had to be born in a manger. A manger is a rock that's kind of curved. It's not a silly posturepedic bed. It's a rock where animals feed. Jesus was born there. Trusting the Father. It's a lot to think about this Christmas. And then consider Jesus is not just that he came down as a human being, but he's care for us. He's care for us. In John 17, where our brother read, John 17, just a couple of verses, uh, verses 14 and 15. John 17, verses 14 and 15. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them, protect them from the evil one. Just like the king in Psalm 144 cared for his subjects, Jesus is praying to the father, Father, I'm praying for them. Keep them, protect them, Father. Protect them. You know how much Jesus cares for you? Uh, now, we must acknowledge that we have troubles in this world. The king in Psalm 144, he acknowledged, right? Even though he was trained for war, he, wanted, he knew that there's evil in this world. And God chooses to use human beings to deal with the evil of this world. And so as Christians, we dare not deny the evil in this world. In fact, in, in John 16, the last verse of John 16, verse 33, he says, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulations, but they courage. I have overcome the world. So in the midst of this evil world, Jesus cares for us. And we need to be realistic, but he cares for us and he has done everything we need to carry on in this world, even though there's evil. So first of all, Jesus totally, completely trusts God the Father, just like the king in Psalm 144, you are my fortress, you're my refuge, you're everything. Jesus had to trust the Father. And just like in Psalm 144, the king prayed for his subjects, so here Jesus is praying for his people. And finally, what are the results? Peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity. I want you to look at the book of Revelation, chapter 22. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, verse uh, chapter 22. Revelation 22. And I'm just going to read seven verses. And this is what we look forward to because Jesus had constant, complete trust in the Father, and he prays for us, and he did everything that's necessary. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river, there was a tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, uh, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will be no longer any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be in their forehead. And there will no longer be any night, and they will have no need of light, of a lamp, nor of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these are the words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirit of the prophet, sent his angel to show to his bondservant the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of this prophecy of this book. We will be with him forever and ever and ever. Jesus had to trust the Father. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if there's any way, take this cup from me. But not my will be done, but thine. 
And you and I have the same choice. Will we this Christmas trust in our heavenly King, Jesus Christ? It's not about things. It's not even about trusting people per se. It's trusting Jesus and loving people and giving to them. But it's our choice. Will you? Merry Christmas. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for King Jesus who trusted you, Lord, completely and he prays for us and we will be blessed forever and ever. Be with those who are considering trusting Jesus. That this morning, Father, you will strengthen their hearts that they will be able to let go of self-sufficiency and pride like you got us to that point, Father, and just humbly receive Jesus. Be with us the rest of the day, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let my life be